being an angel. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Reminded me of that. All right, well, we are uh, moving into chapter 7 tonight, um, making our way through the, uh, the seals being opened, um, being broken open. Um, we're going to get through, uh, well, really, we're just kind of actually picking up with the number, number 6 tonight, and um, we'll look at number 7 next week, as well as uh, moving into um, the trumpets, which follow. So uh, we're, we're looking specifically at this little interlude that happens um, in the midst of the, of the seals of the scroll being opened. I showed you this image last week just as a reminder of where we're at. Um, we've done the intro and the, and, the, and the messages, the throne room in chapters 4 and 5. And now we're in this really large section, chapter 6 through 16, of really focusing in on the judgments which come in these pattern, this, uh, these three sets of seven. Um, so we're still working our way through the first set of seven, which is the seals. We'll start looking at the trumpets next week and then the bowls after that. Um, and really what we're going to see is that it's not so much, I think I mentioned this last week, it's not so much that these are, here's, here's seven events that happen and here's seven more events that happen and here's seven more events that happen, but rather it's um, different ways of looking at um, the, 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 same, the same events that are, that are unfolding in our world. It's really powerful though. Three sets of seven. Because mm -hmm. you have a three in the seven. Seven number of perfection. Three. Yeah. Uh, three is the number of the Trinity. Yeah. So you have all that. And if, you, if, you, if the Bible says, if God says something three times, right. that's like putting S on the end of a word. That's exactly right. And I mean, that's a great point. And, and to say that this is a way, this is God saying, one thing really three different ways is, is what it is. It looks different. Um, it comes at it from different angles. It focuses on different things, but um, really it's, it's kind of talk, discussing the same, same general thing three different, three different times. Um, just as a reminder, I just want to keep reminding us of this because we're moving further away from the messages or moving further away from chapter one where we were introduced to the fact that this um, this is three, there's three different um, literary genres that the book of Revelation falls under, apocalyptic literature, prophecy, and letters. And, and that, that, that last one there that I mentioned is the one that we can move away from the quickest whenever we're getting into Revelation. So I want us to remember, keep in mind, that this is a letter. The book of Revelation is a letter to the first century Christians who are enduring heightened persecutions at the hands of the empire. With this persecution comes a temptation to compromise their faith, so that they can avoid being ostracized in Roman social life as well as violently persecuted by the powers and principalities. So that's kind of two things there that, that can fold into persecution in general. There's the persecution that is just pressure to just be a normal Roman citizen, um, which means going along with the Roman way of life, which is uh, very much in um, compromising their Christian faith. But then there's also violent persecution for many people as well. We, we hear of people being killed um, and, and in prison, that's all forms of violence trying to get them to stop being Christians, right? That's what's going on in the first century. Um, Revelation is first a letter to these Christians to encourage them to remain faithful even unto death and to warn them of the dangers of compromise. And so that's what Revelation, first of all, is. And so we are reminded of that as we go into, <clears throat> as we continue and we pick up where we left off. Um, so we're going to be... Did I skip something? Oh no. Okay, this is back in chapter six. I want us to to just remember where we picked up, where we left off, because we're really picking up right there. Um, there's this big break, obviously, with being a chapter. And you know, if, if you do readings at home, if you read scripture at home, you probably break it into chapters. Um, you normally would read three chapters a day. Um, and obviously, the chapters, like John, when he wrote this down, he didn't write the chapters, right? He didn't put the chapters there. This comes as a later. Um, addition and it makes it easier the verses for instance like that that's all a way to breaking it down to making it easier to reference if I'm if I'm sitting here teaching a lesson or preaching a sermon it's easier to reference so, so you know where to go so that's why they add those later the chapters and verses but part of what ends up happening sometimes is you end up with these breaks that can be kind of hard um, and if you don't think about what's just before it um, the chapter just before it you often um, will kind of miss what's going on and so this is a really important part I won't read all of this but basically what's going on here, we read this last week, is the, the sixth seal is, seal is um, open, it's, it's broken. Um, and so what happens is there's these plague-like events that happen, 
Now we're going to hear a lot about plagues in the next few weeks, but there's these plague-like events that happen. The sun came as black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, the stars of the sky fell to the earth, you know, these big um, drastic things. The sky vanished like rolling itself up, mountain and island were removed. And then what happens is you have the kings of the earth, the magnates, the generals, the rich in power, everyone, slave and free, they hid in the caves of the rocks, they're calling on the mountains to fall on them, right? They're, it's, it's describing these calamities so much so that people are responding in fear and, and um, again, asking this, this dr dramatic and drastic thing of the rocks and mountains falling on them. And, and this question is posed, um, the, the hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So this, this question is posed at the end of chapter 6. This is the end there at chapter 6. Who is able to stand? That is the question being posed. And um, as we go into chapter 7, we're going to start to get an answer to that question. Um, and, and I think when, when, it, when you read this question, again, just kind of stopping there, the, the answer that might come to mind is no one, right? Who is able to stand in the face of God, in the face of God's wrath? No one. No one is able to stand in the face um, of, of the, the wrath of the Lamb and, and of the one on the throne. Um, I mean, consider the calamities that have been allowed to take place. Who could stand in the stand in the face of such plagues? These calamities that are happening. Chapter seven um, sort of seems like a an interruption in the program. We're we're looking at the opening of the seals of the, of the scrolls, and then all of a sudden we move into chapter seven. And what we're going to see is that it kind of feels like it's unrelated to the scrolls. Actually, a lot of um, people who write commentaries. Um, get thrown off by that chapter break too, apparently, because they, they call it an interruption or a, a, a break in the action or something like that, almost like there's a commercial break in what he's describing. Um, but I, wanna, I want to take the, the stance, I want to take the perspective that, again, John didn't write these chapters down, so there's no, you know, the break is only in that a new vision is appearing. But I want to argue that as we move into chapter 7, this is still a part of that seventh, sixth seal breaking open. Okay? You'll see why that's important in a minute. But the, it, it's, it's continuing this theme. This, he, he ends there. Who is it, or in chapter 6, it ends there. Who is able to stand? Well, chapter 7 doesn't want, you to leave, doesn't want to leave us hanging there. It wants to answer that question. And that's really what chapter 7 is about. And because that's what chapter 7 is about, we can't see it as a separate theme. We're still in the seals opening. We're still in the, the breaking of the seals. It's really important for understanding um, what, what's going on. So let's... Uh, Let's look at the first eight verses of chapter 7. It's there on your handout as well. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind could blow on earth or sea or against any tree. I saw another angel ascending from, from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to damage the earth and sea, saying, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have marked the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the people of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Nephtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 and from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. Um, yeah, so again, we're picking up um, and we're beginning to get an answer to that question. Who is able to stand? Um, Let's highlight uh, something. Just make, I just want to make some notes on something. This image of the, the, the four angels standing at the four corners and holding back the, the wind. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty powerful image. It captures our imagination. What does this mean? Um, we're reminded right there at the beginning of the poetic nature of this book. This book is very poetic. There's images. Um, it, it's, it's really kind of pulling on the images in your mind. It really wants you to paint. It wants to paint a picture for you. It's very poetic in its, in its language. Um, John, like everybody else in his time, would have believed that the world was flat. It would have, he would have believed that the earth was flat. And so this, the vision that he has kind of follows in his perspective of the world, is that it, the world is flat. Like that's the perspective that he is given. There's actually, um, 
this is not a rabbit hole that you want to go down. There's actually people who are like really fundamentalist scripture in, in, the, in the version, in, in the way that they read scripture, that they believe that the earth is flat because of verses like this. There's actually several other places in scripture, Isaiah 11, Ezekiel 7, that, that reference the four corners of the earth. And they point to that as, as like evidence that, you know, the moon landing was fake and the earth is actually flat. And again, not, not any wormholes that you want to go down. But, um, but, then, but again, this is, this is how John would have viewed the earth, just like everybody else in his time. They understood the world to be flat. That's how they, that was their perspective. And so his image, the, the vision that he has kind of comes out of what, what his understanding of, of what the earth is. Um, what the four corners really are, north, east, south, and west, that's also how they would describe the winds. Is it a north wind, an east wind, a south wind, a west wind, right? Um, and so the, the four winds match the four corners, north, east, south, and west. Um, and yeah, again, then along with the same thing, we need to, because of all of this, like we're not reading this as a scientific book in that regard. We're reading it as a poetic description of what's going on, a, po- a painting of... Of, um, of an image that, that John has, right, of a vision that John has. And so this image of four angels holding back the winds is poetic language, um, the winds of destruction specifically, right? Um, and so clearly in the way in which the angels will damage, so these, da- these angels are being described as allowing damage to happen in the earth or bringing about damage in the earth. Um, the way that that's going to take place is by releasing the, these winds. Um, Again, since we're taking the perspective that Revelation isn't so much chronological as in this happens, then this happens, and this happens. When, when John says, and then I saw, it's not a, and then this is going to happen, but it's a, I viewed this, I saw this, and then I saw this, and then I saw this. It's not, it's not an order of, of some event that's going to take place so much as this is the order in which I saw these, um, these images. Since we're taking that perspective here... Um, what we need to understand is again, this is still a part of uh, chapter. This is still a part of the sixth seal breaking open. And when when the sixth seal is first broken open, what do we have described? We have these calamities happening, these plague-like events happening, um, and then uh, and then the the people on earth responding to those events and, and pleading for mercy and to, to escape it. Right. <laughs> well, what 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 we need to understand is that the the angels holding back the wind. It's most likely just it's, it's just John kind of jumping back to before those plagues happen. So it's not like the plagues happen and then the angels show up holding back. That's the way he views it. That's the way the images take place. But in reality, the, the winds of calamity, the winds that are coming in destruction, are really those same plagues, which those plagues are going to be broken down even more as we get into the trumpets and the bowls. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but again, it's not chronological. It's not this happens and this happens and this happens. Rather, it's this big... This big event, which is going to be referred to as the Great Tribulation, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, the, the, the great ordeal that takes place being described in different ways. And so it's first described as this general overview of some plagues that happen and the people responding. Now it's being described again, but before it happens, God is saying, hold back um, for the purpose of don't damage the earth or see your trees until we have marked the servants of our God with a seal on their forehead. So before the damage, before the calamities, before the plagues happen, um, they're, they're planning, to, they, they want to mark the servants of God with a seal on their forehead. Um, any questions about that? Was that? Is that clear? Did I lose you there? No, tell me if I lost you, are you? <laughs> well, we lost in the trees. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, so let's talk about this, this uh, second part. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. He called with a loud voice to the four angels, um, don't damage the sea or the earth or the trees, right? Um, so again, we're introduced to those calamities in chapter 6, and now we're being, we're being, they're being described again. Um, chapter 7 is revisiting those judgments from God. But this time it's not focusing on the punishment, right? The, at the end of chapter 6 with the opening of, of the sixth seal, it's focusing on the calamities themselves. It's focusing on um, those that are responding in fear and in terror over the calamities. This time God is focusing on something else because, again, at the end of that chapter, it's who can stand? Who can stand in the, and, and endure the wrath of the Lamb and, and of the one on the throne? 
Um, well, John, again, he writes this book in order to, he writes this letter in order to encourage and strengthen the believers. And so God, I mean, so, so, so John and, and, the, and Jesus, who gives the vision to John, doesn't want them to be left thinking, no one is the answer to that question. No one can stand in the presence of this, of the wrath of the Lamb and the one on the throne. So John wants to get that question answered before the calamitous wind can blow. He wants to know that there is an answer to that question. John tells us that before the calamities are allowed to come, he sees this other angel. The instructions from God are to delay the calamities until the faithful servants are protected. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this next one just because I know I'm already behind. Um, Yes, so we're told that the servants of God are to be marked by a seal. Um, This must take place before the calamities come. The word seal um, is actually the same word that's used to describe the seals on the scrolls, but it's not one of those seals. It's a separate seal, right? It's not one of the seals on the scroll. It's a separate seal. The purpose of a seal, again, we talked about this a few weeks ago, the purpose of a seal is um, an imprint or to, an image, right? It would be the image of a king that would be marked on it. It would, it would signify that it had, been, um, it had not been viewed by the wrong person. It was protected. The contents of it were protected. They were not altered. They were not examined, right? So think of that language there. They are not altered. They are not examined. Now we're talking about people, humans, getting marked with a seal for the purpose of them being protected and, and, and not altered or examined the contents of, the, of them as, as sort of human scrolls. Um, what Old Testament, this image of a, of, of a, of a, a seal, what image, Old Testament images come to mind with the mention of being marked with the seal of God? Anything come to mind? Black trees. Huh? Black trees. What's that? The, the uh, Jews would. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it, got it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't think do I, it, I don't guess I heard the term, yes. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, they, they still do it. Yeah. In, in Israel. Mm-hmm. Well, not just Israel. You'll see the guys walking around with boxes on their heads. Yeah, yeah. And they have they have they have little miniature copies mm-hmm. of the of the law, yep. Torah, in that. Yeah, I uh, in college we made some that were kind of like we made them into like necklaces that you could wear. Is that, ha- is that hazy for religion makers? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, that's perfect, though, and and I think it's going to be sort of mentioned here in a minute. Any other thoughts? What what comes to mind when you think of a seal being marked with a seal from the Old Testament, or being marked? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so talking about what it means, yeah, there are, so there's instances um, in the Old Testament where, where being marked means, you know, don't mess with this person. Do you, can you think of someone specifically? Cain. Cain, right? So Cain, um, after Cain kills Abe, Abel, Abe? Abe, call him Abe for short, I guess. Um, when, after he kills him, after he kills his brother, right? He um, is kind of sent out into the world to be a wanderer, and, and, and Cain's like, they're going to kill me if they see me. And he marks, God specifically marks him so that he will not be killed, right? It's a mark of protection. Um, it's also kind of a curse in that sense, instance, but specifically it's a mark for, for protection. Any other, any other ideas on, on being marked in the Old Testament? I'll go through a, a few of them here real quick. Because these are really going to be important. Again, Old Testament images are just peppered throughout Revelation. It's Revelation's full of them. So, understanding the Old Testament image can help us understand what's being communicated in Revelation. You have another. Did, didn't slave owners mark their slaves? I know they. Did, I know they did later on. I don't know if they did hmm. in the Old Testament. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure about that. They that's possible. Random. Yeah, it's possible. Essentially. Um, I think that's probably a practice just in cultures in general. Okay, so Cain is marked by God in Genesis 4. Um, the Lord put a mark, and think about it, let's hold on to this word. The, the, old, the Hebrew Old Testament word is ut, um, ot, uh, put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him, right? So there's that word ut, a mark. Um, 
circumcision in the Old Testament is a is a sign. Um, you, um, Genesis chapter 17, you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign. Same word, ut, of the covenant between me and you. Um, so that is a sign. That's a very important sign in the Old Testament, right, throughout it. Um, and then Israelites mark the doorpost for protection from the tenth plague. Think about that. We're in the midst of plagues. We're going to be hearing a lot about plagues in Revelation. So this one's particularly key in understanding what the mark means. Um, it it's, uh, happens at Passover um, when they're still in Egypt. And then whenever they're being told how to remember it by, doing, uh, by celebrating the Passover, they're explained again. So you hear that. Chapter 12, verse 13 of Exodus. The blood shall be a sign. Ut. For you on the houses where you live, when you, I see the blood, I will pass over you. So again, this is a sign of do not mess with these people, right? They're protected from the plague as a result of it. And then just one chapter later, when, when Moses is giving the instructions on how to continue doing Passover year after year, it shall serve for you as a sign, oot, on your hand, as a reminder on your forehead, so that the teaching of the Lord may be on your lips. So that's, that's a part of the reminder of how to celebrate Passover. And this is kind of getting into what Pastor Kevin was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, the Shema, which is another one that they would, um, they would kind of put in a little roll up. They would put it on their doorstep and stuff. Listen to the Shema. Um, Shema just means here. It's the first word of this commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign. Oot, same word, on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. So your hand and your forehead. You put one on your forehead. They use, it uses a different word there, but that's the, it's a sign. It's an, it's an oot. It's a mark, right? So this is, this is just showing all the different ways it could be translated. From Cain, it's described as a mark, but it's the same word as sign. Um, in circumcision, in the Shema, the way that they wear the, the, um, um, the Shema on their head. Um, and then this one I think is really, really interesting. Um, in the Old Testament, this is, this is only part of it. You can look it up. It gives the rest of it. It's just zooming in on the top part. These are the high priest garments, which are described in Exodus 28. Um, one of the things that they wore, the high priest wore, was a turban or a, a headpiece. That they, that they wore something that went across their forehead and it said, holy to the Lord. Um, and it's signifying that them as the high priest are representing the, the people are coming before God, set apart, holy, holy unto the Lord, right? And so that is a marking that they wore across their forehead. It was Now the word sign doesn't actually appear in this text, but it's really important because it's connected, right, to being marked, to being to bearing that um, that. The, the name of God on their forehead. And we're going to see all of these reappear in just a little bit. Um, but these, these are all important. What is the mark? What is it to be marked by God? Right? Um, and, and it's pulling from the Old Testament. That's how we understand it. What is the mark exactly? Later on in chapter 14, we don't, we're not told in chapter 7 what the mark is. But then in chapter 14, verse 1, we hear this again, and it's referencing the... the 144,000, which is what we're talking about right now in chapter 7. Then I looked, and there was, a lamb, there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. All right? So again, we can kind of deduce from that that the mark that we're talking about right now in chapter 7 is a mark that is um, the name of the name of God and the, um, and the, uh, the name of the Lamb on the forehead which is exactly what the priests wore, right? Holiness unto the Lord, as in Yahweh the Lord. Um, and so it's bearing God's name. That's what they're marked with, is God's very name. That's really important to understanding what it is that um, chapter 6 is talking about when it talks about the mark of the Lamb and the mark of the Lord on the throne. Um, what benefit might the seal offer to those marked with it? Kind of pulling them from the Old Testament images um, and from what's going on in Revelation right now. What is the benefit of being marked by the seal. Protection, right? Good. Anything else? Identification. Uh, say more about that. That you are identified as being the servant of yeah. the one you are marked. Right, yeah. So it's, it's uh, 
It's whose you are, right? right. Being marked, whose you are, right? Um, who do you belong to? Yes. It's very important for once we get more further and further into the book of Revelation. Who do you belong to? Um, yeah, so um, to be marked with God's seal or sign was something, was sometimes a literal thing in the Old Testament, right? The, the, the priest literally wore that. Um, they, they would often make um, little, little tiny things that they could wear. Or they could put on their doorposts as a mark. Um, but even more than that, that wasn't ultimately the goal, right? God doesn't just want them walking around with it marked on them, right? That's not the point, literally being marked, so much as of what it communicates, right? What it shapes you as. If you are a person who bears that marking, what it means to bear God's name um, and, and how you act and, and who do you belong to? Who, you know, what is your protect? Like, who is, who is it that, that you belong to, right? Um, that says something about you more so than just, oh, I'm where you know i mean we wear christian you know, necklaces and t-shirts right like like you can do that and it mean nothing right you can wear a cross necklace a a, a christian t-shirt and it mean nothing um so that's not ultimately the goal the ult the goal is not a literal being marked but it's it's what it means right what does it mean it means you belong right and so again there's there's sometimes there's this clear literal marking that happens like in the case of um, circumcision, that is a literal marking that is happening. But more than that, it's a sign of a covenant, right? It's a sign. Um, and so it's not the literal thing that matters so much as what it what it means in practice. Yeah, go ahead. I just thought of an example of where, where that symbol, like if you're wearing a t-shirt or, mm -hmm. or whatever, it's not that. That doesn't, in the case of wearing a Christian t-shirt, I remember we were, when I was a freshman, I think it was, We'd go down to night court and watch they bring people in and mm -hmm. and be, to be before the judge and whatever. And they brought this this really dirty looking rough man in, and he had a Trebekah shirt on. Mm -hmm. Kind of almost got us thrown out, but because we kind of reacted. But just because he had that Trebekah shirt doesn't mean sure. that he identified with. Trebekah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so again, that's important. Um, in this case, and I think that the reason that we say that is, is when you start hearing about marks in the Old Testament, we have a, a tendency or a habit of trying to figure out what that is, literally. That's not the point. The point isn't a literal mark. The point is, is who do you belong to? Um, and do you bear that mark in a, uh, in a real way rather than just a literal way, right? You truly belong to, to, to what it is that you claim to, be, to belong to. Um, yeah, so just kind of just what we've said. Those two things. It means you belong to God, and it means that you are protected by God, right? We need to unfold what that protection um, consists of. Because um, this is important. Mitchell Reddish says this. John has no special rapture theology whereby the faithful are exempt from pains and suffering of the world caused by the evils of war and empire. That's the first, uh, that's the first two um, uh, horsemen of the apocalypse, right? They represent the evils of war and empire. Um, the natural calamities, which come with a second and third uh, horsemen, and even after that with the, the plagues, um, and, and persecution, right? Those are the calamities. When we talk about calamities, those are the things we're talking about. Evils of war and empire, natural calamities, and persecution. Um, the, the lamb who conquers is victorious through the pains and sufferings of the world. That is the way of the lamb. The way of the lamb is the way of the cross. So what does it mean to be protected by God then? If it doesn't mean we're exempt from suffering, right? Tons of martyrs um, take place. In the, I mean, there's martyrdoms in the, the, the early church. At no point does John say, there's not going to be any more martyrdoms now. Or there's going to be a point, you know, in... in before the new creation where there will be no more persecution, there will be no more suffering for Christians. Or if you're a Christian, then that means that you ain't got to worry about suffering in this life, just natural you know, suffering or the suffering from evils of war and empire or natural calamities. That's not what being a Christian is about, right? Um, so if that's the case, what does it mean for us to say that the mark um, of God protects them? What does that mean? What do you think that means? It guarantees you a seat on the bus. Okay. You got to suffer for it. You, know, you may suffer, but sure. you still, you know, 
Okay. All right. Well, I think Matthew ten twenty eight. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, mm -hmm. but cannot kill the soul. Okay. Do Good. Not, yeah. So the seal is almost preserving your soul, right? I and mean, we talk about what a seal does. It, it protects the the inner contents, right? It protects the, um, the. It keeps people from from who are not supposed to be influencing, from influencing, right? All right. So yeah, I mean it's perfect. Like I mean, it, the, the promise there by saying you are marked does not mean that you will not suffer. Matter of fact, John's very clear that the Christians are going to be suffering. He's very clear on that. He knows that that he says it's going to get worse. That the suffering for the Christians that he's writing to is going to get worse. He's not telling them that they're going to that, that their suffering is going to end while they're in this world. As a matter of fact, there is going to be more suffering. But what's being protected is you from being compromised, right, in your faith, from you, um, again, we talked about what compromise looks like, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm saying I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm taking this part of being a Christian out so that this part of the world can fit, right, it, it, does that make sense, so you're compromising your faith to make room for worldly desires or worldly uh, passions or whatever it may be, um, and so, um, despite Despite the sufferings in the world, despite the suffering that the Christians will experience, they will be protected. Um, and we'll, we'll, we're going to take a look at that again in a minute. Um, so who is sealed? Um, we're told there at the beginning, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. Um, can't emphasize this enough. That's not a literal number. Matter of fact, I don't think any of the numbers in Revelation are literal. It's not a literal number. It's a representative number. It's a number of perfection again. 144,000 is a number of perfection. It's, uh, it's uh, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. So who do these represent? Well, obviously we can make a lot of speculations. Um, one of the speculations that makes the most sense to me is that it represents the people of God um, as Israel. Um, and and there is this, there's this aspect of Israel that will be preserved and marked by God um, for their uh, faithfulness to God. Um, and, and, but there's, again, there's other speculations that we could make. I really don't want to, I don't, we don't have time to focus on that too much. But, but the point is, is that it's a number, right? It's a very literal, I mean, it's a, it's a very specific number, not a literal number. It's a very specific number. 144,000 are being marked, right? Really not that many. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that many. Um, listen to this part. This is really important. I heard. The number. I heard. Okay? We've seen this before in, in Revelation. Chapter 4, or chapter 5. What, did, what was John being told by the elder who was worthy to open the scroll? I heard what? A lion. I heard a lion. lion. Right. I heard a lion. I saw a lamb. Here again, we're being told, I heard. I heard that there was the number, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of Israel. Um, we're set up here, all right? We're being set up in a good way. We're being set up with this vision on earth with John hearing the number 144,000. Picking back up where we've left off. After this, I saw, okay? I heard 144,000. I saw there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing Standing? Doing what? Standing? Who can stand? That's the question from chapter 6, right? Who can stand? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. I love that the image starts out with him standing. That answers the question of chapter six: Who can stand in the presence of in the, the face of this 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 God? They end up falling on their faces in reverence, but at first they're standing to show that they can stand um, in the presence of God. Um, then one of the elders addressed me, saying, "Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from?" I said to him, "Sir, you are the one that knows." Then he said to me, These are those who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eye. Um, I saw. So this is what he sees in order to answer that question, who can stand? And there's that clear connection, who is standing, and is this great multitude. Um, how does this crowd that's being described here in these verses differ from the one mentioned in the first vision, which is of the 144,000? How does it differ? Well, there's no number. There's yeah. No, yeah there's no, right. no one could count. It goes from 144,000, a very specific number, to a number that no one can count. That's a big difference. What else? Right? Yeah, so he's seeing it instead of just hearing it, right? Good. It wasn't just the 12 tribes. It's not just the 12 tribes of Israel. It's not just one people group, right? Man, this is the good news of the gospel right here. I mean, this is what the gospel's about. Um, it's what we're doing in Acts right now on Sundays. This is the gospel, right? Not just Israel, not just one people group, a great multitude, no one can count from every single nation, all tribes and peoples and languages. He saw, I mean, he heard a very specific number of group from one tribe, one people. He sees a multitude that no one can count um, from every tribe and every peoples and every language. That is a powerful image, right? And we understand that that's the same thing that's happening before as, as I heard a lion, I saw a lamb. I heard a very specific number from one specific group, people group, but I saw an unlimited number of people from an unlimited um, number of people groups and, and tribes and tongues. That is powerful. Um, so again, we see that image. Oh, that's way blurrier than I realized. He hears 144,000. He sees. This is the answer. Um, and it's cut off there. It's on the front there. Um, who, can, who can stand? They can. They can stand. Um, yeah, it's a powerful vision. Um, what does it mean for the church that the saved crowd is from every nation, tribe, peoples, and languages? What do you think that means for the church? Is it just some future off thing when we get to heaven, you know? What do you think it means for us? He did tell us to go into all in the world. Yeah. That is a part of our mandate, right? That's part of the mandate. That's who we're to, that's who we're to disciple and, and yep. teach and baptize. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, any other thoughts on that? I mean, well, like you said, I mean, it's going to be all different kinds of people, different churches, Baptists, Nazareth. Sure. Yeah. Denominations, traditions, right? Yep. Yeah. There's going to be people there that we don't think will yeah. be there. Yeah. We'll be surprised. <laughs> we'll be surprised by presence and absence of it. Yeah. But that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, I think what I really want us to think about is we can we can sometimes look at these visions and read about these visions and there's something that's going to happen one day. We're going to experience it one day. It doesn't really mean anything for us now, but everything we've just described, um, that because this is who we're going to be, because we're going to see Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and, and all kinds of other traditions there, how should we interact with those people now, right? As our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? How should we interact with people from other nations and tongues and tribes, right? Um, as if they're our brothers and sisters, right? And so that's a really important. That, that, that applies now. We should be acting now as if we are... Um, um, in the throne room of God, right? That is, that is really the call of this text, I believe. Um, what's the significance of salvation belonging to God? Because this is the way they cry out. Salvation belongs to our God. They're not saying, we got salvation. We got salvation, yes. Salvation belongs to our God. What is the significance of that? We're saved by grace. Okay. Good. And not of ourselves. Yeah, gospel, right? <laughs> gospel. And where the grace is from God. It's yep. God's grace mm -hmm. that saves us. So it's his salvation to yep. give to us, not yep. us. Right. Salvation belongs to our God. What else? What's the significance of this? A 
that no, in, in no way is it about anybody that's there. Right? This great multitude of people. It, it's about them as a, as, a, as a whole, together, worshiping God, but only in so, in so far as they're participating in what God is doing. They are receiving what God is doing from the Old Testament all the way through the Bible. No one can be holy apart from God, right? No one, no one derives their holiness from something else. They can only be holy in so far as that they are um, in the presence of God, right? I heard a quote from Abraham Lincoln just uh, just that yesterday, and he said, "It's not doesn't matter if I'm on if God's on my side. Mm. It matters that I'm on God's side." Yeah, yeah, Amen. Yeah, because it. God didn't belong to me. Right. God yeah. didn't belong to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, don't get me started on that again. I preached on that this Sunday, right? Yeah. This past Sunday. Um, yeah, so uh, this guy, these guys, Edgar and Arthur, they say the lesson from Revelation has something significant to say about the understanding of salvation by the first Christians. The universal testimony, in other words, all of these people together, the universal testimony of all who were saved is that salvation belongs to our God and the Lamb. That is to say, humility. Humility is the mark of those who have been saved. All is God's. Nothing is ours. Again, if they're bearing their Yahweh's name, they've been marked with Yahweh's name and the, and the Lamb's name. It's not their name. It's not my name on the forehead. It's not, you know, and, and there's, even talk, there's even conversations in Revelation about, you, you know, you're having your name in the Lamb's book of life, and that becomes the image that so often we're obsessed with and focused on. We talk about salvation, and, and that's not what they're focused on, right? They're focused on not my name, the name of God, the name of the Lamb, right, on their, on their forehead. It's not about me. It's not about me having my salvation. It's not about my salvation at all. It's about me participating and receiving what God has done for us, right, um, for all of us, right? So the faithful have aligned themselves with the cause of Christ. They have made his faithfulness their own faithfulness, and even unto death their faithfulness, um, they, they've maintained that faithfulness. Um, yeah. I'll preach, right? Um, what is the salvation that they speak of? You know, we think about this question. I mean, we talk about this. Like, we just all know what it is, right? We know what salvation is, right? We don't need to talk about that. But let's consider it. And I might have to, we might have to pick back this lesson up next week, and that'll be all right. Um, what, what, what is it to say? You know, what is the salvation? What, what is it? You, uh, and, and, and this might go back to what it means to be sealed by God, right? Um, there, there's that level of, um, despite the sufferings of the world, right? Despite the tribulation of the world, um, you still belong to God, right? Belonging to God through it all. Yeah, and being united with God in the end. Any other thoughts? What does it mean to be saved? Salvation is drawing closer to God. Yeah. And that be becoming more like Him. Mm -hmm. Just when we get to heaven? No, that's the pinnacle of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. To be saved in your life, Jesus, in your heart. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this idea of, of being drawing close to God. Right. Being um Having God so close to you, closer than you could ever imagine, closer than you are to yourself. In my heart. Yeah. That's as close as you can get. Right? Yeah, yeah, closer than you are to yourself. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, those, these are all, I think I, I want to highlight that, again, as Pastor Kevin said, it's about becoming like Christ, um, so much so that Christ, it, it, we, are, we are in Christ and Christ is in us, right? Um, it's not. It is about. It is about heaven. It is about that that throne room of worship, and we look forward to that. And 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 that image. Those images are what help us continue on the journey. But it's not just the destination, right? Salvation isn't, isn't just the destination. It's the journey, right? It's the whole thing. I mean, as good Wesleyans would say, it 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 is not just the destination. That's not just I'm I'm set for heaven. That is a part of it. Um, but that's not the purpose, ultimately. The, ultimately, the purpose is, is that our lives are caught up in God's life, right? Our, our existence is, 
is wholly dependent and, and for the sake of God's life, right? We are no longer our own, but we are God's. That is what salvation is, is to, to no longer be only focused on myself and, and my salvation, right? But to be a part of God's salvation. That's, what, that's ultimately what this text is teaching us, I think. I think it's just, to me, it's when we draw closer to God, so when the time comes for us to be with Him, yeah. In, the, in, in eternity, mm. it also makes the transition a lot smoother. <laughs> because the closer we are to Him, the more we are living in that kingdom. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I mean, there's so much that I could say. I am going to oh, stop awesome. here. I've still got, we're getting into the great ordeal, the great tribulation, and I do not have time to talk about that today. Um, so I do want to, I want to pause here, but I just want to. Really, really pause on that and just to, to really think about it, right? Um, being brought into the life of God. It's not, it is ultimately, it finds its, it finds its end, which is the word telos. It, it finds its goal. Um, uh, the word I haven't really introduced to you um, yet, but the, the word eschaton, which is the end thing, the, the things of the end. That's what Revelation is about, is the things of the end. Um, the goal, right? The, the end purpose. Salvation does find its purpose there. It's hope there right the hope is is there um but we're not just sitting around waiting on it right um revelation is clear on that too we're not sitting around waiting for something that's going to happen one day or being swept up you know but rather um we want and desire to know christ now to live within christ's um, life now and to have christ living within us now to know god now um is to know christ and christ crucified and so, anyway, I just I think that's so important um, as we as we look on this image, this beautiful image of the throne room um, of the end, and we are reminded that that is the hope, that is what spurs us on in the faith. But ultimately, our, the 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 purpose of salvation is for faithfulness. Now, we are you know in 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 Luke, for instance, well, in all the gospel accounts, Jesus Jesus goes and he heals someone. He he, he heals. Um, I'm trying to think of someone he heals. Uh, uh, the woman who's who's bleeding, right? Um, uh, uh, what does he say that she receives salvation? Now, we, we just typically mean, we apply that to mean, oh, she got saved then, too, as, as well as healed. But the word there is being applied to her being healed, right? Um, and and I, I've, I've heard it pointed out, this is so funny, in Luke's gospel especially, that that word is employed a lot to, to describe someone's state, like someone who was healed, physically healed, their body was healed, it's descri they're described as receiving salvation, but it doesn't were translated that way. It always translates it as they were healed. But that word is the same word that is used later on when Zacchaeus, for instance, who was not was not um, ill in his body, was not needing healing in his body, but rather had greed. Right? He was taking advantage of people and he was stealing from people. And when Christ visits him, he says, "I'm going to give everything. I'm going to I'm going to return everyone. If I've defrauded anyone, I'm going to pay it back." And the, and the text says he was he was healed, he was saved. But the translations always say saved then. It's the same word that's used to describe someone being bodily healed. And so to say that we're saved is not just about some you know, soul thing. It's our whole being. We, we've experienced salvation. And now not only is our soul reserved for heaven, that's a part of it, but we also, um, we also are, are saved now. We're saved from the... From, from, being led into compromising our faith now. We're being saved from um, sin now. Not just the results of sin, not just the punishment of sin, but living in sin. Living in sin is bad, right? Living in sin is not good. It destroys our lives. It may feel good in the moment at times, but it destroys our lives. And so to be saved from something that looks really good by compromising, by compromise, which is what Revelation is about, compromising our faiths to incorporate the empire, um, that, that feels good, feels comfortable, feels like a good thing to do for the, the people who are reading this letter originally. Um, but ultimately, it, it has detrimental effects on us. It causes us to compromise our faith. And so we're being saved from that. We're being sealed from that, right, from, and protection from that. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me preach a little sermon there real quick. Um, any, any final thoughts, questions? We'll pick this back up next week, start looking at the Great Tribulation. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for um, 
for your salvation that you allow us to participate in. Thank you for coming and showing us the way, for being the sheep, for being the lamb, um, who also leads us and, and shepherds us, Lord, as, um, as your text tells us. Help us, oh God, um, to understand that just how deep that goes, Lord, not just something we hope for in the future, but something that transforms us and changes the way that we are living in the present. We thank you, O oh God, for all that you do for us. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Would you go with us now into this week? Help us to be your people, marked by your name and the name of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.